to misread this. This could be hazardous. There they are. I wrote down some things about you, Dottie, that I knew you'd be proud to hear. So I hope they will record um, the introduction for Dottie Smith today. She is a mentor. She's the answer to Charles's prayer. She is given to hospitality. She is a cook. She is a lady. She is a mother. She is a conference speaker. She has been known to walk off platforms. She has been known to fall into drum sets. She's spirit-led, word-driven, Mother, wife, pastor, and grandmother. She's Dolly Smith from Silver Springs, Maryland. Let's make her welcome today. Thank you for my fan club. <laughs> oh, God bless you. Why don't you just stand with me? The afternoon session is always a challenging session. And after you have eaten, we don't want the spirit of slumber to come upon you. Why don't you just open your hands and your hearts before the Lord. Welcome, 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 welcome. Lord, you have captured our hearts. And we give you thanks. Everything within us responds to you. You are our life. We delight in you. You're the rock under our feet. You're the shield. Father, you are a strong tower. We run unto you and we're safe. And we invite you now to come, continue to come. You love to dwell in this place. Lord, thank you that your people are learning how to welcome your presence learning how to receive your blessing, learning how to receive your word. And so in Jesus' name, we just bow to you today and we acknowledge that you are Lord of Lords and King of Kings and we give you thanks with all of our hearts in Jesus' name. Oh, hallelujah. Amen, amen, oh, amen. <laughs> Well, my husband got his plug in this morning, didn't he? Normally I get a, an opportunity to share mine first. But uh, I, I just wanna say this, that uh, Charles and I were birthed in revival in 1950. In December, he celebrated his 50th year in the kingdom. And in March, I will celebrate my 50th year in the kingdom. And our backgrounds are that we came out of non-Christian homes and we came out of a liberal church. Don't remember having heard the gospel preached and want to share this with you. For years, I wondered how some of us got in. The youth group in the Dutch Reformed Church were about 30 teenagers. We were 12, 13, 14 years old. And with the exception of one out of the 30, we all came out of non-Christian homes and we were dynamically converted and our lives were changed. In fact, our growing up years, our learning to assert our own individual ways was our parents would say, you are not going to church. You spend too much time in church. You are not, it's time to go to a party. There's a dance. Why don't you go there? And my kids, when they hear that, you know, think that is, and my mother would say to me, are you reading that Bible again? <laughs> you know, you, if you keep reading that Bible, you're never going to find anybody who will ever be interested in marrying you because you're so religious. Then they met Charles and they said, Ive, he's worse than you are. <laughs> 
but you know, our backgrounds were very, very different. Our parents never went to church with us. They sent us. And so when we were birthed in 1950, 51 into the kingdom, the big question was, how did we get there? Who prayed for us? How did this happen? And I want to share something with you in terms of vision. Because a number of years later, we were ministering at the Tennessee, Georgia camps, and we had an opportunity to just fellowship with Derek Prince at that time, and he made an observation that I'll never forget. We talked about what happened in our lives around 49, 50, 51. And, and we said, you know, we often wondered, how, you know, who was praying for us? And Derek made a statement. And he said, you were birthed during a season of revival. There was, and my husband mentioned it this morning, there was uh, the outpouring in Argentina with Dr. Ed Miller. And by the way, he made a profound impact. Uh, Dr. Ed Miller made a profound impact upon our lives as young people. And there was that Argentine revival, there was the Latter Rain revival in Canada, and there was the Hebrides revival. And Derek made a statement that I pray will be a, a, a vision, an envisionment for you. He said, you know, whenever God pours out his spirit, saints all over the earth, often preceding revival, are sowing into the heavens. They're sowing intercession. And if you can visualize in Roman, I mean in Revelation, that there are golden bowls, and it's like we're sowing in intercession, in prayer, into the bowls in the presence of the Lord. And seasons of revival are in the spirit, God taking those bowls and dumping them all over the earth. And Derek made this statement and he said, he said, you were apprehended because there, the heavens were seated with intercessions for the youth. And, and the youth were being interceded for north, south, east, west. And when God moves by the power of his spirit, it's like he goes, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. All over the earth he goes. And what I sense is that our prayers are not geographically limited. That's why bridging the Americas is essential. They are not geographically limited. I am convinced that some of the intercessions that even went on in Argentina were those that seeded the heavens because both in the Hebrides and in Argentina, so many of the youth were apprehended. So I want to share with you, may the Lord open our eyes as to the power of intercession in terms of seeding the heavens and the Lord then turning it over and going across the whole earth. So we were brought into the kingdom. And one of the things that I look back on, and I would like you to turn with me to uh, Psalm 71, and I am going to share with you on what is God looking for in the earth. What is God looking for in the earth? I obviously have known my husband for 50 years. We are married uh, almost 38 years out of those 50. And uh, we do, we have three wonderful daughters and we have two awesome grandsons. Can I show you their pictures? I mean, I'm an obnoxious grandmother. Someone said to me, are you an obnoxious grandmother? I said, you bet. I mean, they are the cutest boys. And, and we just speak the destiny of the Lord in their lives. When I, when I walk with them and when I babysit them, I hold them to my heart and I say, you are born to love Jesus Christ. And Chase Patrick, you are going to serve him all the days of your life. And we have the boys at different times in our church nursery and grandma will go in there and pull them out of the nursery and take them into the sanctuary and the first time I took Chase Patrick that is the older he was sitting with me in the sanctuary and we have worship music playing and he just looked all over and I took him and I took him up by the cross and I said, you're going to know the God of that cross, Chase Patrick. And he would look and then I put him on my husband's pulpit. And he looked all around and I said, and you were born to preach the word. I want you to know I have a heart for the generations. And as for me and my household, we will serve the Lord.
we will serve the Lord. And from babes in arms, you begin to declare the inheritance of the Lord and the destiny of the Lord. And no matter what happens with any of your kids, the Lord may bring them back and you may do reparenting like what we were able to do and say, forgive us. That was We did this wrong and we did that wrong. It was an awesome time. But at any rate, I, I was impressed with the th whole theme of what is God doing upon the earth in this present hour. But as we're leading to that, if you would turn with me to Psalm 71, just as, a, as an introduction, I think generationally, and I want to challenge you not to think just simply concerning yourself, but to have a vision for the generations. Those of you that are parents, that are aunts, that are moms, uh, are grandmothers, that there is a generation that we have a responsibility for. And if you look at Psalm 71, verse 17, uh, a while back, I had what I would call a gratitude meltdown. Say with me, a gratitude meltdown. What happens when you have a meltdown? What happens when you have a meltdown? Any of you ever have a meltdown? It's a meltdown. Well, I had a gratitude meltdown that was provoked by this particular scripture. And I want to encourage you, may you receive the anointing of gratitude meltdowns all the time. If you look at this, verse 17 of Psalm 71, since my youth, O God, you have taught me. And to this day, I declare your marvelous deeds. And even when I am old and gray, do not forsake me, O God, till I declare your power to the next generation and your might to all who are to come. I want you to underline that. And as I read that, I said to the Lord, since my youth, O God, you have taught me. And I sensed the Lord wink and say, let's spend some time talking about it. And the Lord and I went through a spiritual journey. And I want to encourage you, whether you know the Lord one month, one year, two years, you have some heritage, you have some history with the Lord. And the Lord and I sat down. Since my youth, oh God, you have taught me. And I said, uh, Lord, remember the night when you first got a hold of my heart, the scripture around which I was converted was behold I stand at the door and knock if any man hear my voice and open the door I will come in and sup with him and it was like in my memory I went back to the 12 year old girl I was who did not know the Lord and in the midst of that someone knocked on the door and it was our pastors I have to tell you this too it was our pastors daughters who had just come to the Lord themselves this is very significant who had just come to the Lord themselves, through whom the gospel came to my heart. How many of you know who were the instruments in your own salvation? Who are the instruments in your own salvation? Have you ever told them thank you? About two years ago, the woman that led me to the Lord, I hadn't seen her for 38 years. She walked through our church doors. She looked a little different. I looked a little different after 38 years. And I put my arms around her and I said, Betty, thank you for telling me about Jesus. Where would I be if you didn't? And there's some of you that I want to tell you right offhand that when you leave our days together, you are going to be empowered and bold to speak the gospel. And the Lord is going to open up doors for you to win people to a knowledge of Jesus Christ. He's going to open up uh, the doors for us to be able to declare that Jesus loves you. Where would we be? Where would you be if someone had not faithfully shared with you the gospel of Jesus Christ? And as I sat there and I said, Lord, when I was 12 and then when I was 15, my first book is The Delight of Being His Daughter. And the reason for that, and I won't go into all of the details of it, except to say this, that I grew up with a very serious illness and at the age of 15 had to leave high school for six months because I was so sick. And I, 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 a lot of things took place. You talk of hope deferred. Uh, I was in the pit of discouragement and disillusionment as a 15 year old, I was bedridden. And in the middle, January 1954, five o'clock in the morning, the Holy Ghost came to me in a dream and I awoke. And that little living room in Brooklyn, New York was filled with the presence of the living God. And I remember, it was like I was there. 
And I said, oh my God, I'm not ready to meet you. And it was like the Lord said, and what have you done for me? And I said, no, Lord, if you give me my life back, I will serve you all the days that I live. And the Holy Ghost flooded my life January 1954. And for two hours, you talk about being saturated, wave upon wave upon wave of the Holy Ghost filled me. And the Father said to me, I love you with an everlasting love. And it was like the inner hurts that I had even accumulated as a child. I, my daddy got up to check on me at 6.30 in the morning and I said, Papa, Papa, God loves me. And he goes with his heavy German accent and he says, Ach, Mata, Mata, the to, to fever too high, much, much too high fever. I don't know what she's talking about. And I said, I said, what, what religious music? The only thing we had was from the student prince, I'll walk with God. That was the only religious music in our house. And so I said, play it. I'll walk with God from this day on. I don't know if you, if you know that, but I will forever be grateful for Mari Alonza singing, I'll walk with God. Right? It, it is, it is it linked with my being baptized in the Holy Ghost. And I remember within, and I won't get into all of those details, but within three weeks, I was put together in such an unprecedented way, mentally, emotionally, physically, the Holy Ghost, when he came, gave me such a revelation of the Father's love that I knew I was loved. And my average went from a 72 to a 94 in school because many, and that's one of the reasons I went into the teaching field, because many kids don't learn because of emotional woundedness. And the Holy Ghost is there to renew the mind. He took the cobwebs off the mind and something happened in my soul. I knew I was loved. And for that reason, Numbers of years ago, I was in a worship meeting and I just said, oh, Father, it's such a delight to be your daughter. And one of the revelations, one of the things God is doing on the earth in this hour is causing his people to delight in being loved. I'm loved. And as the Holy Ghost is poured out in your heart and mine, we are going to be lovers of men. We're going to be lovers. And when you love people, you will also become fishers of men. The Lord and I sat and we recounted. And it was by the time I finished going through the seasons of my life, the pits, the valleys, as well as the mountains, I was on my face weeping my heart out with gratitude. And I just said, thank you, thank you, thank you. Are you grateful? I want to read to you a statement. A couple of weeks ago, we were having a missions conference, and uh, it, there were parts of it that absolutely changed my life. And there is a statistic that I want to read to you. Uh, this is from Dr. Howard Fultz, who was with us from Regent University. And here's the statistic. Each year, 50.5 million people die worldwide. Of these 50.5 million people who die every year, 31.1 million are not Christians. And of that 31.1 million non-Christian deaths, 12.5 million die having never heard the name of Jesus Christ. 12.5 every year die having not once heard the name of Jesus Christ. I appreciated our sister this morning when the passion of her heart was overflowing about for the lost. And the other night as we were worshiping the Lord, I thought, you've been my life for 50 years. In you I live and move and have my being. What would it be if I had never known you? What would my life be? How, how You are everything. And there are 12.5 million every year who have never even heard about you. And as I was even sitting there, I felt a rumble in my spirit and a cry. My God, mobilize this generation. 
to bring the gospel into our neighborhoods, into our countries, and into this world as never before. And I am praying that there would be an envisionment, a Holy Ghost envisionment, that God so loved the world. And you know what? You and I then begin to sanctify ourselves. You know, we don't, we don't run around all of our own needs continuously. We're going to get our needs met so that we can go into the harvest and accomplish what he has called us to do in the harvest of Jesus Christ. I am not going to come to get blessed and blessed without getting empowered to bring that word. Oh, I have to tell you about Mexico. Our friends who are here from Mexico, the Awake Deborah team. For some of you that don't know, uh, Brenda and Diane and Lila and I have a ball going around the country. And my husband often laughs because sometimes we have come into our own home and the four of us stay together and we share and we share our hearts and we pray together and we get all, into all sorts of trouble. And, and this time, by the way, we said our husbands were coming. I said, now all of us came with our husbands so that especially the sisters could meet the other part of us, say, because we're not complete until you see that other part of us. But at any rate, we went down to Mexico and I was so busy before I got there that I usually like to look at the map to see where I'm going around this world. But I was in the plane, met Diane in Houston, and ended up late at night, I don't know where. And we got out of this little tiny airport, and I looked at Diane and I said, where are we? Uh, where am I? <laughs> and there was a huge map in the airport of Mexico. And I stood there and just was impressed to study this map and then saw where we were. We were in around the Puebla area. Something got into my heart as I looked at Mexico. And during the week, it was awesome. I mean, I, I, I will tell you, it, just being with uh, these gals and over 5,000 gals showed up. And one of my favorite tales is how Diane called everybody up for prayer, noticed 5,000 people come here, and uh, precious women came. And then she and Brenda are down in the spirit. And all these people are coming. And I went to Brenda and I said, get up, get up right now, get up. And I said, there are thousands of women to pray for, get up. And Brenda said, oh, yeah. and she tried, well, she was gone. And, and, I, I, and then I went over to Diane and I said, Diane, you started this. Get up here. What are you doing down? And she said, oh, I'm coming. Then laughed and down she goes. So our precious sisters joined us and I looked at Lila and I said, well, it's up to us and the rest of our sisters here to minister to these 5,000 women. <laughs> So we're trying to learn how to move in the anointing and not fall in it all the time because there is work to be done, right? And you've got to be carriers of that glory and imparters of that glory. So we're still working on that. I'm not getting too successful with Diana and especially Brenda. I mean, man. But at any rate, during the week, my heart was captured. There is a marvelous work of God in Puebla. I, I was so impressed with the way the Holy Spirit has fallen upon that, upon just different places all over there in Mexico and how highly uh, Victor and Gloria Richards are esteemed in that nation and something was being birthed. Well, at any rate, if you think, how many of you feel a little tired during these days physically? Do you get a little tired? We go morning, noon, and night. Well, there's nothing compared to what we did in Mexico. In fact, you know, you think we worship here. You should see the way they were. Everything moves amongst the Hispanics. Every, I mean, I try to do it with them, and I, there were muscles that I didn't know I had. And, and then we would look at one another, and I'd say, hey, did you move that muscle before? I mean, I can hardly, you know, and they were going. I mean, we just, there's nothing like some of these dances, right? I came home and I thought, we need, I need to teach my husband how to do some of this stuff because there were no age barriers on this. Well, I tell you what, we would dance, we would shout. There was such a sense of the triumph of Jesus Christ. Well, I was tired. Then I said to Brenda, I said, Brenda, you know what? I, I say, couldn't we come a little bit later because they worship so long and Brenda goes, oh, no, she said, worship is the Lord's due. We can miss anything, but you can't miss worship. That belongs to him. I said, all right, we'll go, we'll go. <laughs> so I say all of that 
to say that when we got to bed, I was exhausted. But it, when the adrenaline is working, it takes a while, right? And I'm laying there, finally I doze off, and within about 45 minutes, I'm wide awake. I was so annoyed, and I said, Lord, and the Lord gave me an open vision. I didn't, I wasn't too excited at first. I was more tired than excited about an open vision. And, and yet, as I lay there, I was exhausted, and I saw that same map of Mexico. And I want you to know that has transformed my life. There's something I've seen as a result of my experience there. And I saw the map covered with like desert sand, but right under the sand, the whole, the whole Mexico was covered with desert sand. Under the sand, there were these, you could see like jewels. Jewels were all under this sand. And I got down into one area of Mexico with my eyes, and here was this hag-like spirit with her foot solidly over a, a section of Puebla. And Tita, that was just before you were also ministering. What you ministered on was very significant. And it was in this whole area that I saw this hag-like demonic spirit. And as I'm watching this from the top of the nation, Jesus begins to walk. And he simply walked slowly across the whole map with his hands open. And you could just see the, the wounds in his hands. And he got to this demonic spirit, showed his hands and said, Mexico is mine. Mexico is mine. And this spirit shriveled and was gone. And the Lord bent over and retrieved a diamond where her foot was and began to polish the diamond. And what I saw in that particular area was that women were, had been held down in an unusual way. And the diamond began to be all of these women, all of these women. And as they were being released, they were jewels in his crown. They went north, east, south, and west and began to retrieve the jewels all over, began to dig and find jewels all over Mexico. And the word of the Lord was, I am bringing forth a deliverance and I am bringing forth a healing. And I feel in many ways that the women are going to be so instrumental in redeeming the generations. They're going to go after their children. They're going to go after their grandchildren and they're going to make prophetic proclamations these children will have a root of righteousness in this land and there will be a heritage that will be birthed increasingly we are speaking of bridging the, the, the nations bridging the hemispheres and there is something that is happening from Argentina when we were in Argentina well, I'm, I'm going to jump ahead of myself because something happened to me down there as well. And, and something happened to me in Toronto. And I was thinking, my God, you're sort of putting deposits within all. There is a cross-pollinization that is definitely taking place. You've heard words. Cindy Jacobs came with the word cluster. The word networking, the, narrow, uh, the word partnering, these are Holy Ghost terms that are coming forth. And I sensed as the Lord showed me this whole thing and as we saw those 5,000 women leap and praise the Lord, I'll never be the same. It was like Revelation 5 became so revelatory to me that out of every nation and every people and every tribe, every culture, he will redeem a people who will stand before the throne and say, worthy is the lamb, worthy is the lamb. And I am gonna ask my sisters from Mexico to simply stand. And, and Carol and I'm gonna, Diane, I, I want you just to even lay hands on them. Can you reach out your hands? Why don't you stand with me for a moment? These are key gals, and Sister Tita had the word for that conference in so many ways concerning the name that is above every name. 
the name of the Lord, the name of Jesus Christ, and that these women were to be set free from the spirit of intimidation, set free from that which has held them back, set free to be who they have been called to be. And so, Lord Jesus, in Jesus' name, we bless our sisters as being representative of what you are doing in Mexico. And we declare that these are mothers in Israel, that they shall have the word of the Lord in their mouth, that they shall speak the word of the Lord. They shall be trainers of their children and of their grandchildren, of the children in their congregations. Father, release them from any spirit of intimidation. Release them, Lord, from anything that would hold them back. In the name of Jesus Christ, we speak blessing and impartation in the name of the Lord. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Just release blessing over them. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Oh, God, bring forth in all of Mexico, bring forth a heritage for yourself. Oh, we give you thanks. Oh, we give you thanks. Hallelujah. You may be seated. They're going to continue to minister over them. And we've all learned how to flow in this, haven't we? Let me tell you what happened to us in Argentina because I want you to see how there is a cross pollinization. John spoke the other night, or yesterday morning, concerning just their impartation. And our brother and sister are coming from Argentina. They are here now, they'll be here tonight. And when we went down there and we visited the different churches and, and uh, we were in one of the sessions and I ended up in the women's prison. And when I was there, I actually was quite ill. And uh, you talk about hope deferred. I remember sitting in some of the meetings in Argentina and I almost didn't go because I had certain kinds of infections that were, I could not get exposed to any kind of germs and I went in faith and when I got there, I kept getting worse. And I was sitting in one of the meetings and thinking, my God, I pray for others. My God, you know, and my heart, well, I, I just thought, Lord, have you ever wondered, with all you know of him, if there aren't areas that he just forgets? You know, don't you feel sometimes like writing your name and address on a piece of paper and saying, hello, read this. This is where I live. Huh? Well, yes. Well, at any rate, I'm in a women's prison. And uh, all the way on the bus going there, I was just really in a lot of discomfort. And uh, we got into this women's prison and the women's prisons, by the way, there's a phenomenal move of the Holy Spirit in the men's prison. Yeah, if you've never read about that, it is just an awesome takeover of one of these uh, uh, prisons in Argentina that has transformed m the whole prison system. But in the women's prison, the children are with the women until four years old. So they, they can birth their children in the prison and the children are with them. And so we were in this uh, kind of dilapidated gym holding meetings. And uh, since my uh, Spanish is extremely limited, uh, my ministry was one of hugging and laying hands on and praying. But I watched a brother standing on the side who radiated, just radiated just the grace of God. And I said to one of the people, who is that? And they said, he's out of the men's prison. He was there as he was mad. He was just out of his mind. He was crippled over. He was so demonically uh, possessed that they just kept him in a certain ward. And he had the spirit of infirmity and was just bent over. Well, to make a very long story short, in that prison, he was one of the ones got, that got swept into the kingdom during that prison revival. He was delivered, released, and healed so much so that when his wife came to see him, she walked right past him. Uh, 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 a couple of weeks later, totally did not recognize him. His life was so transformed, and I believe they said he didn't get more than a third grade education. And I watched him, and I saw the glory, the glory of him, the glory of the Lord on him, carriers of his glory. God increase carriers of his glory. And I saw him, and all of a sudden, I saw he was praying for people. 
And I said to the one gal, I know he's praying for all these gals in prison, but I'm going too. <laughs> and, I, and I went and stood right in the middle of these women. And uh, when he got to me, he had a prophecy that was interpreted that identified a real key to the source of my problem. And he laid hands, just that it didn't even just didn't even touch me. And I went down on that dirty gym floor. I didn't even know if there was anybody there that picked, that that let me fall. I was down there. And I remember when I looked around, I thought, oh my, the floor is dirty, but such glory on this dirty floor. <laughs> And I want you to know that was how many years ago? Four, five years ago? Something like that. Something was imparted to me physically that has changed my life. And all I can say is there was a deposit in Argentina. There was a deposit in Mexico. There was a deposit in Toronto. My heart, I mean, just uh, uh, to, to realize God is cross-pollinating. He is causing us cross-culturally. He's causing us in, in just in our fellowships just to receive from one another. When we were down here in 1995 for the first pastor's conference, I watched the same glory. Watch for people who carry the glory. I saw the glory on Brenda Kilpatrick and I'm sitting here and I'm older than she is I'm longer in the kingdom than she is and I sat there and thought she's got something I need and she doesn't remember this because the Lord has so linked us together now in heart and in ministry but at the end I ran over to her knelt by her and said pray for me little did I know that that would be a beginning of something that was so linked in the spirit. What is the Lord looking for upon this earth? And I'm gonna give you these two things. He is looking for a people who will touch him. He is looking for a resting place in the earth. And I want you to look with me at two scriptures because I want Diane to do something with me and I'm gonna get Carol in on this too in a few moments. Look with me to Isaiah 66. He's looking for a people. He's looking for a resting place. And I love this scripture, and I have an appeal to make through this all. In Isaiah 66, very familiar. This is what the Lord says. Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. Where is the house you will build for me? Where is the resting place for me? Has not my hands made all these things, and so they came into being, declares the Lord. Where is my resting place? You know, the Lord has a hang-up about resting places. If you've, if, I, I give a plug for my husband's book on Heart After God. It is a, a, a biography, a spiritual devotional biography of David's life. And you wonder what made David a man after God's own heart. And if you study the Old Testament, the people were given all sorts of boundaries not to be able to come near to the Lord. The people had to stay on the mountain. And yet, what does the Lord do? He spends books outlining how he's going to get right in the middle of them. They can't come to me, but I'm coming right there. I want my tabernacle right in the middle of the camp. And they've, that they build a sanctuary for me, the ark. And I was thinking, what is your hang up with the Ark of the Covenant? It's awesome. And what is this thing about establishing in the last days the tabernacle of David? What is that all about? I hope you have an inquiring mind and that you go after the Lord. You get in his face and say, oh God, I want to know you. Oh, I love you, but I want to know you. And I want to know about your word. And I want to know what is this tabernacle of David? You gave no instructions. You gave lengthy instructions on the tabernacle of Moses. You gave lengthy instructions concerning the, the temple of Solomon. And what is this tabernacle of David? And of course, my husband can do an awesome job on this, but he speaks about what was the main difference between Saul and David? How many of you know what it was the main difference? You, speak to me. What, what, what did Saul never do during the years of his reign? Saul never inquired after the Ark of the Covenant. What was the first thing that David did? He went after the Ark of the Covenant. And you know that the Ark of the Covenant represents the glory, the Shekinah glory, the very presence of our living God. 
Saul did not have a hunger and a passion after the heart, after the presence of the Lord, and David couldn't live without him. And one of the things concerning the tabernacle of David, and again, I just, the heart after God will unfold this. But, you know, I often wonder that, that as Uzzah touched the ark and he gets struck dead, David captures the ark and puts it in his own backyard. I often wondered, how did he get away with that? How did he get away with putting the ark in his pup tent in his backyard? I mean, how you, you don't do that to an ark. Especially the ark of the covenant, the ark of his presence. There was a passion for the presence of the Lord. And David says in Psalm 132, I will not sleep, I will not eat until I find a resting place for my God. One of the first things the Lord is looking for is people who will welcome him. A resting place for him. Oh God, may my life be a place that you can rest in, that you can delight in. Where will my resting place be? And here, and if you, I don't know how many of you are going to hear it, young people, those of you that are at the school, I'm going to tell you something that you probably won't believe, but about 20 years from now, it'll dawn on you that you heard it someplace. This, look at the next thing, verse 2, has not my hand made all these things, and so they came into being, declares the Lord. This is the one I esteem. What kind of resting place is he looking for? This is the one that I esteem. He who is, read it to me, humble and contrite in spirit, and who does what? There are two qualities the Lord's looking for. A humility of spirit and a reverence for his word. We are very privileged to live in the Washington, D.C. area. I will tell you that during the inaugural week, all sorts of things were happening. And we've got people that are working in the White House. We got them up on the hill. And the reports that coming back Something broke over the Capitol during the inauguration. There, there is no question about it. We have some people that are security people that get in the White House and their statement was that there's been like a cleansing through the White House. There are prayer meetings that are taking place that my husband mentioned it this morning. And, and one of our pastors was in with one of our senators in a prophetic council in one of the Senate offices. I mean, that's unprecedented. And during the inauguration, I sat watching those events and I wept. And I received another picture from the Lord. And I saw, you know that in the Old Testament, the way the kings went is the way the people went. Right? If there were evil kings, the people went off. If there were godly kings, revival came in. And I want to just declare to us that we do have a window of opportunity at this time. And I saw the hand of the Lord on the top of the states and underneath. It was like from top to bottom. And there was a coming together. And as I'm watching this, the Lord spoke prophetically to my heart. And he said, I have given you an opportunity a window of opportunity where there will be an open heaven on this level and you as my church will bring forth an open heaven on the grassroots level there will be prayer and intercession and praise and worship will fill this place no wonder the lord is talking about 24 hours of prayer and place after place how he's just there's a breathing why he's looking for a resting place He's looking for a place where he is totally at home, totally welcome, where his word is being listened to and obeyed. And holiness, one of the reasons Malachi was so powerful is that we are really a grace-based church. Out of much that we went through, we have come to know his awesome grace. And, and this Malachi was a little different for some of our people because many of them went, oh, as, as some of the issues from Malachi were presented, and of course they were done with much great depth uh, because he took just a chapter every week of Malachi, the conviction of the Holy Ghost fell in such a way that we had repentances all over the place. The Lord is cleaning his house, and our prayer is, give us the fear of the Lord, which is to hate evil. Can you say that? Father, give me a baptism of the fear of the Lord, which is to hate evil. 
Oh God, give me a sensitivity to what pleases you and to what grieves you. Baptize me in the fear of the Lord. I sense that there's something at work amongst the people of God where it's not like we cower because perfect love casts out all fear. It has nothing to do with terror. It has to do with such an awesome revelation that he is a holy God and he will have a pure offering and with a pure heart and clean hands, even according to Malachi, we shall present offerings of righteousness before him. Something is happening across this earth and he is looking for a resting place the other thing he is looking for and you know and I think of some of the young people from the Bible school oh how I covet you know I want another 100 years <laughs> 50 years I look back on and I think what a privilege what an honor to serve the Lord and I can just say if you're a young person if you've given your heart to the Lord go for it and don't compromise go for it and don't compromise in any way one of the things that Cindy uh, Jacobs was mentioning was the cluster anointing and I w want to just throw out for you that I see the Lord and those of you that are single and some of you that are young and you're sort of looking around to see, does the Lord have anybody here for me? I mean, I sort of know how that all works. But I would say this, you want your marriage to count for Jesus Christ. You want the cluster of the wine with this union to be so rich and so productive for the kingdom of God. And you know what you're going to do? There are times in which Charles and I annoy one another. And I think this would be a good time to have a good fight. And the Lord will say, really, you will sanctify yourselves. You do not have that luxury. And I will tell you that that luxury for apathy, for irritations, for things that would distract us, I don't believe we have that luxury. He is bringing us into a relationship individually, as couples, as churches, where the cluster of the wine is coming together. And I once said to the Lord, you know, I know this was idealistic, but at the age of 17, by the way, when I was baptized in the spirit at 15, you know what the evidence was in my life? That book became alive. I have taught the scriptures from 15 years old on, and I pray that you will have a love for the word of God, that you will not be shallow, but that you will have the spirit of wisdom and revelation in your understanding of him, that the eyes of your heart will be illumined, that you might know the hope of your calling, and that you will know that your word is a light to my feet, and that you will have a love for the word of God, a love for truth, one of the things in the end times is that they will not be lovers of truth. And at the age of 15, when the Holy Ghost invaded my life, I had a love for this book. And I started to teach it and have never stopped. And I pray, young people, you have an opportunity. Those of you in the Bible school, you have an opportunity to study. Don't waste your hours. Use this season as a discipline and a delight to get into the Word and to study well. I sense that as I'm looking around, that at times, and I shared this in Mexico as well, but I didn't realize, but Mexico, the state, your state emblem is the bird, is the eagle, right? Is the eagle. And that was one of the other things that I saw, was that I saw an eagle, and I keep seeing it. We heard it last night. But an eagle must have two wings to soar into the heavenlies. What happens if you're only soaring with one? How are you going to go in circles? And I won't go into all of this, but Luke 24 was illumined to me here in Brownsville. When, oh, well, I will. You have to look with me to Luke 24. Look with me just to Luke 24. What is he doing on the earth? He is looking for a resting place. And as he comes and rests, he's looking for a people who will respond to him. I asked the Lord concerning David. I said, Lord, why David? What was there about David? And I'll just throw this out with you that, uh, you know, David wanted to build the house of the Lord. And you know that he, he, he couldn't do that because the Lord said, you're a man of, of war. But there was a scripture uh, that I read in, in Kings where uh, Solomon says concerning his dad, he said, uh, the Lord came to my father and said, uh, uh, David, you can't build the temple. 
You'll do all the preparation, all the work for it. But then there was a statement, but what a good idea you had. What a good idea you had. And that leaped off the page that the Lord would say to David, what a good idea you had. And as I sat there, I said, Lord, you're looking for people who are going to go beyond obedience, who are going to go beyond the obligation of what I have to do, but who will do like the woman with the alabaster box. Did the Lord ever tell her to break the alabaster box? No, the love that God is pouring into our hearts is making us go beyond what we have to. And where we just say, I love you so much, even as that woman, I love you so much, is there anything I can pour over you? And David said, I love you so much. I can't bear that you live in a house that is less than mine. I'm gonna build your house. Lord says, you can't, but oh, David, what a good idea you had. And I said, Lord, I wanna be the kind of a person that has Holy Ghost creative ideas, ways to put smiles on your face, ways to have you just stop and say, Really? You want to do that for me? Yes, because I love you. The woman broke that alabaster box, not because the Lord said, Thou shalt break the alabaster box, but because there was such a creative overflow of the love. Oh, hallelujah. Well, at any rate, Isaiah, I mean, uh, Luke chapter 24. You can see I drive my husband crazy. My, I, I just have to, I can see him even now. Uh, he, he, he's a very methodical teacher. And he went away to India, and we have a Bible school on Tuesday nights, and he said to me, you are going to teach for me. And he said, and this is what you're going to do. You're going to teach 2 Chronicles 36, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther. And then he said, now look at me. And I looked at him, and he said, what are you teaching? I said, 2 Chronicles 36, Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah. Then he said, and you're not going to go into John. You're not going to go into Proverbs. You're not going to run around in Revelation. He said, when I come back, I want 2 Chronicles 36, Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah. Well, he got my dander up in the Holy Ghost. And I said, I am going to teach. Second Chronicles 36, Ezra, Esther, Nehemiah. Boy, did I work. Did I see because I, I'm a prophetic soul and I just flow with it. I, I want you to know I had a, I, an experience that was awesome. I studied those books. I devoured them. I got into the history of it. I got into the geography of it. I got into the Hebrew words and I thought, oh boy. And you know what actually happened to me? I, as I got through it, I was so impressed with God's awesome plan of salvation that I was someplace in Esther. I had done the whole sweep of it. And I put the book, put the Bible down, and I got on my face. And I said, you're awesome. Your word is awesome. Such revelation on his plan of salvation. I want to tell you something. When the word of the Lord begins to become alive to you, you're not going to have to try to have faith. Faith will just arise. The revelation of the word, and I am praying a hunger for the word, that you would be men and women of the truth, that you would be women, men and women of the spirit, but men and women of the truth. And look at this. In verse 27, there are two things that makes the eagle in this day fly. There are two things he is looking for. He's looking for a people who will receive this. In verse 27, this is Jesus. Oh, Lord, verse 25. And he said to them, how foolish you are and how slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Christ have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, what did he do? He explained to them what? What was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. I said to Charles, this was so rhema to me. I said to Charles, what do you think he told them? It says that he explained to them the prophets, Moses, the Psalms, and everything about himself. And I said, what do you think he told them? Well, the next morning he got up and he said, why don't we find out? So you know what we're doing presently? going from Genesis through Malachi 
to see the footprints of Jesus Christ all through that Old Testament. And I will tell you what, when you begin to see the revelation of our God through the revelation and unfolding of his word, you will praise him. Nobody will have to say, get up and praise him. Something will fill your heart at that revelation. Well, these, this is what the Lord did in verse 45. And this is one of your wings. And I want you to stand with me. I'm going to read it to you. Just stand with me. Because you're going to fly with me. Huh? Because some of you need to fly. Otherwise, I'm going to lose you completely. You're going to fly. You're one wing. This is what he says in verse 45. Then he opened their minds so they could what? Understand the scriptures. He did what? He opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. One of the things he is doing is opening the minds of his people so that we understand the scriptures because they are the foundation of our faith. And when all sorts of deception comes in, my hope is built on nothing less but Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ the solid rock I stand. All of the ground is sinking sand. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he hath said, to you who for refuge to Jesus have fled. Oh, those hymnists, I love the hymns of the church. Those hymnists had solid theology. He opened their minds so that they could understand the scripture. God is looking for a resting place where he will have people whom he can open their minds. Put your hand over your mind. Just put it over your mind and say, Lord Jesus, open my mind that I may understand the scriptures. Oh, hallelujah. That's one of your wings, saints. And I want to encourage you, God does not leave your mind at the door when he baptizes you in the Holy Ghost. He renews your mind. The entrance of your word bringeth light. Open our minds. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds that you may prove the good and acceptable and perfect will of the Father. And then the other wing, he said in verse 49, I'm going to send you what my father has promised, but stay in the city until you have been clothed, what? With power from on high. Oh, say, Lord, clothe me with power from on high. Oh, hallelujah, just breathe in. Oh, clothe us, Lord. Clothe us, I just release, Lord, the power of your anointing upon these, your people. Lord, come open the minds. Father, unlock our hearts. Give us perception in the word. Give us anointing in your spirit. Clothe us with power from on high. Oh, we just receive from you. We just receive from you. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Lord. There are some of you that are going to go back to the word, and it's going to be like it was translated from the Greek for you. And the Lord is going to woo you and show you his ways through that word. Oh, hallelujah. You will be lovers of truth, and you will fly like an eagle because you will worship him in spirit and in truth. The two are essential. How about soaring? Just soar with both arms, both wings. Lord, they that wait upon the Lord, they shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings as an eagle. Oh, hallelujah. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Hallelujah. We are eagle saints in this day, Lord. Eagle saints. And we receive from you, Lord. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. You may be seated, I'm, I'm gonna give you just one last scripture. How many of you know the two things that have to happen before Jesus comes back again? They're in Matthew 24, and one is in Matthew 23. And I, oh Lord. By the way, I, I could spend just all day in, in just his presence all day in his word. I mean, it just is awesome. But I'm also a grandmother. I'm a cook. She told you all of that. Uh, I get very spiritual cleaning my floors. Go for it. Matthew 24. There are two things that are signposts for this last day. Two things. 
Before he comes, what is he doing on the earth? He's finding a resting place for himself, and he is looking for a people, a resting place and a sending place. And I will tell you what, some of you young people and some of you older people, we just sent two people over to Nepal. One is 65, a woman, one of my good friends, and the other one is 23. And they are going, I tell you what, troopers, I'm seeing more people retiring to go to the mission field. I mean, hey, it's awesome. There's no retirement. I mean, whether you're young or old, there is a call to fulfill your destiny. A call to fulfill the destiny of the Lord. And when I stand in his presence, I want to know that I have done and finished the work that he's given me to do with joy, with absolute joy. The two things, verse 37 of Matthew 23, Jesus cries over the city. Oh, so much could be said about this. Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you who kill the prophets and stone those sent to you, how often I have longed to gather your children together as a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were not willing. Look, your house is left to you desolate. For I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, till you say blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Israel is one of the targets and one of the things that's essential for an encounter with the Holy Ghost and the Messiah before he comes. And he says, you're not going to see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So you watch Israel, the intercessions for Israel are absolutely increasing. And whatever they're doing amongst themselves, sometimes I read some of those events and think, my God, what is going on there? But he is in control, and we are to pray for the salvation of Israel. We are to pray for the salvation of Israel. The second thing is found in Matthew 24, verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom will be preached where? In the whole world as a testimony to all nations, and then what? then the end will come. Two things. Israel shall receive a message. Israel is going to have a revelation of the Messiah. And the second thing is the gospel will be preached into the whole world. And God, send us. Send us. Give us a burden in prayer. I was so impressed with this. Charles has had it since we've been teenagers. Charles has had a burden for Tibet. By the way, I didn't finish telling you when I was 17 what I said to the Lord. The Lord dealt with me about my willingness to be single when I was, well, a little bit older than that, but I had made a commitment earlier. And I said to the, I was just like the Lord said, are you willing to be single? And I said, no, I'm not. It came out of Psalm 73. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And there's none that I desire upon the earth except thee. Though my flesh and my heart may fail, yet the Lord is my strength and my portion forever. And I said, oh Lord, I have no one in heaven but you. And the Holy Ghost spoke to me. And he said, am I also your completion on earth? I said, I don't think so. And I, I, I honestly, and I, and I pray you have an open, I mean, he knows what you think. I could sound religious to him, but my heart's not there. So I just say to him, and so I said to him, but Lord, if you're really laying that trip on me, would you make me willing? I, I, I know you enough that I want to delight in your will. I don't want to just grit my teeth. His will is good, acceptable, and perfect. So I said, Lord, just do it. And you know what? I just have to tell you this. You know how we did it? You know how he did it? I said, no, I'm not willing. And then I forgot about it. But I said, Lord, make me willing. I want to do whatever you want to do. And then I said, P.S., if I do marry, it's on this condition. See, I was so idealistic at 17. I said, if I do marry, I will marry only if the union of my life with the life of my husband will bring you more glory than my life could bring you alone. And you know what? He did it. He did it. He did it. And we have run for almost 38 years together. And there is a cluster anointing in the union between a husband and a wife for the kingdom. There are times we've sanctified ourselves for the kingdom. And I want to just say, go for it. Just go for it. And you, you make your commitments before him. And you know, I was at a Queens College in New York City which is part of the University of New York. It's predominantly Jewish. And the Lord laid on the hearts of 15 of us students 
I was a philosophy major, which is a whole other, a whole other, a whole other thing. But at any rate, the Lord laid on the hearts of 15 of us students to hold a massive evangelistic campaign on this campus. We were just crazy. We had no money. We had nothing but idealism and faith. We did. And so we rented this hall that held almost 500 students. 15 of us did this. And we were making financial commitments that we, and we brought in this top, top scholarly evangelist from NYU. And all of us, and I was president of this youth group, I mean, of this, of the university. And I remember waking up in the middle of the night, you know, at night, you don't seem to have as much faith as you do during the day. I don't know if you've ever felt that, but I woke up in the middle of the night and I went, Ivy, what did I do? Where are we going to get? Who, nobody's interested. This is a predominantly Jewish cat. What have we, I went into a panic. Well, as a result of that panic, I called everybody else to fast and pray. I said, we're going to fast and pray. We walked the campus. I mean, I, was, I can't say I went into this in faith. I had nightmares that I would walk into Remsen Building that held almost 500 students, and there 15 of us were the only ones there. Well, we prayed, and we prayed, and the day came. And I remember not wanting to go. <laughs> I thought, couldn't I stay home today? <laughs> well, I, I'll never forget. It's one of my highlights in my memory bank. I walked into Remsen, and there was standing room only. And I remember standing at the back, hearing the gospel so powerfully proclaimed within the context of academia. And afterwards, we saw various Jewish students come to the Messiah. Ah, oh, ah, oh, ah. Oh. And one story you have to hear, it's my life-changing story. Because we, we had this Bible study, and some of the students may have even heard me share this before. We had this Bible study after these evangelistic series and invited these students in the cafeteria. We said, we're going to hold a Bible study. It's not a Bible study. We said, we're going to read New Testament documents because you can't reject anything that you haven't first read. So come to the cafeteria at 3 o'clock every Friday, and we're going to look at the New Testament documents, and the one document we're going to look at is John. And you can read it with us, and you simply tell us what you think it says. Well, at any rate, they came. We got them from all the different departments, anthropology, sociology. They came from all over the place, and we had this little reading the New Testament documents. And all of a sudden, in the middle of it, one of the students gets up, and he says, you know, you Christians are so boring. And I said, oh, really? And some of the other, we, inter we interchanged with him. And he said, you don't really know how to make a study exciting. He said, if this is what this is supposed to be. So we said, okay, hot shot, you do it. And so this wonderful Jewish student says, okay, what are we reading in this document? And we said, okay, we're on this certain section of John. And he said, okay, I'll lead your next discussion and show you how it should be done. Well, we ended up at somebody's home, and he did all of his historical and verbal and all sorts of studies. And in that, in that season, in that, in that meeting, uh, he, he was in John and then asked some questions, and all of a sudden, we're in Romans. And as we were in Romans, we read Romans 6, and he's reading that even as in Christ... We have been baptized into Christ's death. Even so, we are raised up in newness to life in Jesus Christ. And <laughs> he turned white. He put the Bible on his lap and he said, Oh my God, he's alive. He was almost like shell-shocked, and so were we. I mean, you know what? It was one of those Holy Ghost Kairos moments where you didn't say a thing. He put the book down, walked into a side room, and we didn't know what to do. We just sat there. And after a few moments, we went in, and tears are running down his face. And we said, Eddie, what happened? And he said, you tell me. What happened to me? And I remember we said to him, it's obvious the Messiah 
has made himself known to you. Let me tell you something. When you see people redeemed out of the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light, your problems become incidental. The faith will whelm up within you. And during those days, we saw students ushered into the kingdom. It was an awesome time. And I had completely forgotten this discussion on Psalm 73. And one night I came before the Lord and I said, it is so awesome to serve you. Wears me out at times, but it's awesome to serve you. And the Lord said to me, am I enough for you now? And I said, Lord, if you allow me to reap a harvest, Honestly, whether it's single or married, I want the harvest. Let me get into the kingdom of darkness and bring out those into the kingdom of light. He is looking for a resting place and he is looking for those he can send who will say, here am I, send me. Here am I, pray through me. Here am I, here's my resources. Charles came to me and we're, we're giving all this money away. And, and he said to me, my dear, let's double what we're giving into Nepal and to India. And, I'm, and I said, well, can we do that? And he said, let's go for it. And I, I, I just sense that God is mobilizing resources. He will pour out his Holy Ghost once again. I believe it. I believe it's going to be on Canada. I believe it's going to be on America, on Mexico, Central America, Latin America, Argentina. But I believe it's going to sweep all over the earth. We had one of the most touching testimonies that often, the, what are the name of that tribe? The, what is that with a name above all names? The Sherpas. And, I, I, and I'm with this, there's one last passage that we're going to just look at in this. Look with me to uh, Matthew 9. This is the last passage. The Sherpas, we're doing a study of all the unreached people groups. I have a passion for the unreached people groups. I am not content that every year at least 12.5 million people die having never heard Jesus Christ. And that ought to burn within your heart. There's a vision God is implanting within us, a vision for the harvest. And we, we looked at this documentary where it's an awesome story. I, I, I wish we even had some more of the details that we have at home. But one night, and it was a long series of things, but there was someone, and what was he, Muslim? Islam. Charles, come here, tell them that. Because you know it better than I do. I mean, it's such an awesome story, but he's got the details, and he'll get upset with me if I don't give you the details. There was a young Sherpa boy, and his name was Gal Sung just in one of the little villages that had never heard the gospel of Jesus at the foothills of the Himalaya mountains. And one afternoon he was out with his mother tending the Jumos and he had a fit. He fell to the ground and she could not raise him back up again. But while he was in that state of unconsciousness, he said that two shadow beings came to him and said, we want your life. We want to teach you the ways of Buddhism. And to make a long story short, for several years after that, evening by evening, he would sleep alone by himself with a butter lamp by his head. He was told not to mingle with other people, but just stay with his parents. Evening by evening, over the next several years, these two spirit beings would take him out of this world into the next world, and there he was presented with the image of Buddha. And Buddha spoke to him and said, I am going to show you the ways of Buddhism. You are going to serve me. You are going to expand my kingdom. At the time that this began to happen, there were some brothers and sisters here in the United States of America that began to pray for this Sherpa group of people, an unreached people group in Nepal, pray that there would be a penetration of the gospel into that people group. And during the night seasons, as Gal Sung would be having these visions and these revelations, a name of the gods was given to him. There were some 30 num, some names of gods that were given to him. And every evening they were to bow down three times, mentioning the names of these gods. And all of a sudden, out of the clear blue sky, the name of Jesus appears. And he said he had never heard the name of Jesus, which is Sherpa for Jesus. He said he had never heard that name before. 
And over the ensuing days, the name of Jesus began to rise on this list of 33 gods to where it became higher and higher and higher and higher. And actually, the name of Galsung's testimony is Jesus' name above all names. And as the name of Jesus on this list surfaced and became close to the top, he had one final visitation in the night in which he was told that I am done with you. My kingdom no longer can work through you. And servants of Jesus are going to come to your home and you are to follow him. And to make a long story short, longer story short, two missionaries, and we had the privilege of beating one of them, Barnabas, who works for Gospel Recordings, who testified that this is the exact true story. They came to, by accident, came to this home, and as they were giving a testimony of the Gospel of the Lord Jesus, this one man says, we've heard this before. And they said, where did you hear it? They said, my crazy brother has been having these dreams and these visions, and we've heard this story before. Well, they wanted to meet this crazy brother, which was Galsung, to whom the name of Jesus had been revealed. And when they explained the simple gospel message to him, he knew so much of it already by revelation, and he gave his heart to the Lord. And then his mother came to the Lord, and his father came to the Lord, and his brother and sister-in-law went to uh, Bible school just west of Kathmandu and he told how his father now uh, leads the Sherpa folks when they come together they he leads them in worship and praise because he's a maker of instruments and a writer of songs and his mother passed away and she he said in his testimony that she is the first Sherpa around the throne of God and that whole village was penetrated because people prayed and the Lord supernaturally revealed himself right through all of the deception of Buddhism and revealed the precious name of Jesus. And I believe, folks, that that's a mandate that is upon us. We can all intercede, we can give to send others, and we ourselves can go until people group after people group has been penetrated with the precious name of Jesus. And the next time I go to Nepal, I am praying that I will be able to go to this little Sherpa village and meet this young man, uh, Galsung, and get to know him personally. We saw a video in which we actually saw footage on him and his family, and it is a wonder to behold. Amen. That was the story. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Does that, you know, there's something that the Lord wants you to grasp about the power of intercession, and that you are to cross and build the bridges through intercession. Lila spoke on that the other night. And I want you to stand with me now. As we are concluding, I'm going to read to you. Just, just stand with me because that will be a sure sign that I have to finish. Matthew chapter 9. And what is God doing on the earth? He's looking for a resting place. He's looking for a dwelling place. He's looking for a people who will have a passion for him that will be unrelenting and uncompromising, that will go for it. And he's looking for a people to send. In Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. I want to just say this as well healing every disease and sickness. Uh, John or not shared that one of the things we are sensing is there will be a, once again a release for the apostolic anointing, signs and wonders shall accomplish, shall accompany. Signs and wonders shall accompany. And there is a hunger within our hearts, not for the signs and wonders as such, but for those signs and wonders. They are signs to the reality of the living Christ. And we will not let you go. Do you hear that, Lord? We're not going to let you go until we see once again the signs and wonders released. Release signs and wonders, healings and miracles so that your word will be proclaimed in power. He went through and he preached and he taught and he healed. And he looked at the, sh at the crowds. Do you look at the crowds? I'm a New Yorker. I love driving in the, in the elevators, in the subways. And I'm a people studier. I would often look at those, those people and I think, oh God, this must be how Jesus felt. He said he saw the crowds and he had compassion on them because they were mangled and torn like sheep. 
What do you see when you look at people? What do you see? Oh, to go through your local supermarkets and through the mall. You know, I, I, I at times will pick up clothes that are strewn all over the place. You know, I have people looking at me as I'm putting clothes back on again. And I do it for you. And I do it because there are times people look. And I'll say for Jesus. You know, and I think, God, to be able to say to people, God bless you. Look at the crowds. They're mangled and they're torn. And he had compassion. And compassion is the vehicle through which signs and wonders work. And because compassion is so critical, the enemy is doing an onslaught to the body of Christ through violence to make us insensitive to the needs of people. You get so accustomed to tragedies and murders and killings that something happens to the compassion of your heart. God, release compassion. Release. And then he said to them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. And the word to send out means to eject, cast out, drive out, expel. It is a violent word. Ask the Lord of the harvest to re eject workers out of their comfort zones, out of their own need mentality. There's a, a world to win. For Jesus Christ. How many of you will be resting places? Oh God, here we are. Enjoy yourself. Enjoy yourself in our lives. Oh Lord, we yield to you. We respond to you. We love you, Lord. Let us be to your pleasure. Oh God, may you see the travail of your soul in our lives and in our families, in our congregations, in our nations. And may you be satisfied. Lord, I pray that you will have people here who will go beyond obedience. Who will just be so creative in their love for you. Oh, God, we give you thanks. And then, Lord, here we are. There are some of you that are going to be brought into a new plateau of intercession. There are unreached people groups. There are people that the Lord is going to burden you for. And even as this brother in the Sherpa village, was, the Lord was able to penetrate darkness through the intercessions of these people in the states who received a burden. Isn't that incredible? The Lord has so linked himself to our intercessions Oh, Father, here we are. I'm asking now in the name of Jesus Christ, release an intercessory burden. Release, Lord, an anointing for the prayer room. An anointing, a revelation, Lord. Let us build bridges in the spiritual realm. Oh, Father, here we are. We yield to you. We yield ourselves to you. Pray through us. My God, intercede through us. And when there are faces that come to our minds, let us lift them up. And Lord, I'm asking that not only will you pray through us, but that you will send us. Oh, hallelujah. How many of you sense that the Lord has called you? He's called you. And you shall receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And you shall be witnesses unto me in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the world. Oh, God. And we ask that we might do it with a broken and a contrite spirit. Father, I pray, oh, Lord, for the grace of humility. And when you got to knock us around a little bit, we're going to complain. You know that. But do it anyhow. Do it anyhow. That you might break areas of pride within us, Lord. That we would be a broken and a humble people. People you can trust. People who will yield to one another. People who will serve one another. Oh God, here we are. Here we are. We have heard your voice. And we say, send us. Oh, we give you thanks. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. If you are a husband and wife team... I want you just to come and stand here. If you as husband and wife are linked in the gospel together, you just come, just stand here.
Brother Victor and Gloria, I want you up here with us. Hallelujah. John and Carol, I want you up here with us too, my precious husband, if you would come. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. There's power in the cluster. There's power in the cluster. And I want to prophesy to you that you're going to sanctify yourselves and your relationship for the sake of the kingdom. You're going to sanctify your finances for the sake of the kingdom. You will make a difference. You will make a difference in this generation. Those of you that are older, you're interceding for your children, for your grandchildren, and you're not going to let go until every one of your kids and your grandkids are serving the Lord, are fulfilling their destiny. The Lord is going to encourage your heart. He's going to give you strategy in the Holy Ghost to know how to pray. And then you're going to get alongside of other brothers and sisters. And you're going to say, I'm going to pray with you for your family. Oh, hallelujah. Brother Victor, I just sense, I want you and Gloria just to pray over these people. You first. Oh, God. Oh, God. Lord, we just declare an anointing on every one of our brothers and sisters, Lord, to be able to break bindings in their families over their generations. Lord, cause an aggressiveness in this spirit to rise within us, Lord, to take authority over the enemy and what he's done in our families. Oh, God, we declare your blessing on our families, on our children, on our grandchildren, and even great-grandchildren, Lord, that they shall serve you all the days of their lives. Oh, God, we pray for your spiritual authority on us, oh, God, to be able to impact our generation, to be able to impact, Lord, those around us, Lord, that they can see the families, that the families are serving you in the name of Jesus. Call them out, oh, Lord God, call them out, and then thrust them out, oh, Lord God. Oh, Lord God, uh, put an end to this living for comfort and luxury, oh, Lord God, and to see your kingdom, Lord God, as the greatest thing that we can lay hold of. Oh, Lord God, set them free from the chains, the chains of luxury, the chains of things, hallelujah. Splein heiken Reutmann, sprich Latnon, Free from selfishness, free from fear, oh Lord God, free from holding on to things that have no real eternal value, oh Santo Aslo, Semena Hasakandai, Heshlevrandahache. Hallelujah, hallelujah. And I would like you as couples to turn around and we're going to reach out our hands towards those of you that are single or perhaps your mate isn't here. And we're going to release over you a blessing and an anointing. The best is yet to come. The wine of the Lord is yet to come. And there is going to be a releasing of people all over the earth. I'm going to ask Diane to pray over you as we speak the blessing of the Lord, the healing of the Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Lord, you sent forth your gifts, Lord. And you spoke forth, Lord, your giftings. And you said that, that we as ministers, Lord, would teach others that they may do the work of the ministry. So, Father, we just now send forth the, the blessing, Lord. We just speak forth the blessing of anointing over those, Lord, who may not have yet found a place that they, that they fit. Or they may not work together, Lord, with someone else in ministry. But, Father, they're working and laboring for you. Now I pray, God just a, a release, Lord, like never before, that they won't see themselves as misfits nor spare tires in the kingdom, but they will see themselves as intricate parts that are necessary to have the gospel go around the world and the silos of God may be filled with the harvest that is around the world waiting to be reaped, O oh Lord, because there is nothing wrong with the harvest, but there so we pray now that you would eject them into the harvest. In Jesus' name, eject them into the field that they may be one, Lord, that you have called by your name. Oh, hallelujah. And I don't know how this all works, but I'm going to ask Brother John Arnott to pray concerning the releasing of signs and wonders. And for Carol to pray for issues of inner healing. 
and I want you just to stand. One of the things before we can go, we must learn how to receive. The more we receive of his love, the more we receive of his healing, the more the flow will come through us. And so I want you to receive an impartation. Oh, hallelujah. Hallelujah. Father, we cannot give away what we have not first received. Yes. And you called your disciples unto yourself. That was the first thing. And then you gave them power and authority over all sickness and all disease and all demons. And so we come to you and we say, God, fill me with the Holy Spirit. Fill me again. Fill me again. I want to be so full of God. And then go out in the strength of it and give it away. Father, I pray that you will so ignite a hunger in the hearts of everyone here that they will be clamoring for you. Lord, more than sleep, we desire the presence of the living God. We want to be filled with all the fullness of God. Lord, let there be a, a faith that's ignited in our hearts to go and do the things that Jesus said, to lay our hands upon people and pray for them and believe that the kingdom of God comes right at that moment. Lord, your kingdom is now, now, now. Bring it, Father. And as, as they go out and they sense the needs that people have, give them boldness to lay their hands upon those friends and neighbors and associates. And just say, may I pray for you? And watch the kingdom of God come to their amazement with signs and wonders and deep conviction of the reality of these things. In Jesus' precious name, Lord God. Amen. Now reach up your hands and take it. This is your inheritance as a Christian, as a believer. Signs and wonders shall follow those that believe. Say it to yourself. Signs and wonders shall follow me because I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I take a hold of my inheritance and I believe for miracles in the name of Jesus. Yeah. And Father, I just pray, Lord, that you would just come and, and just release your people. Lord, to be honest and open, Father. Lord, that if there's areas that they're struggling with, Lord, it is not a shame to be struggling with an area. Lord, what a shame is, is that they keep it and try. Lord, I give them permission as a leader in the body of Christ. I give you permission to let the walls down, to find someone safe to go to and have these problems work through. It is not a reproach. It is not a shame. And the Lord is so healing people in these days. And he wants us without spot and wrinkle. Jesus said Satan came, but he found nothing in him. Can we say the same, that there's nothing, whoa, that we're hiding? And I just give you permission today to find a safe place, whoa, to get healed and to get free. And Lord, I pray that blessing upon each one. Lord, that that fear of exposure, that fear of letting the walls down, that fear of intimate revelation of the heart, Lord, I break that off of God's people today, and I free you. Lord, I ask that a sovereign gift of trust would come from the Father into each heart. Lord, that they would be able to open their hearts Lord, to someone else and to you, Lord, especially to you, and say, Lord, this is the area I can't seem to get free. Lord, could you lead me? Could you show me that one I could go to? Father, I bless these ones, Lord, with an incredible anointing of unity, an incredible unity. Whoa. Lord, with these men and women here today, Father, Lord God, I ask that you would just empower them Whoa, in their ministries. Father, I love what Dottie said. Lord, a fight. 
wasn't a luxury we can afford. So Lord, I ask that you would open the windows, Lord, of discussion, of communication over each husband and wife in this whole place, Lord, even if your husband and your wife isn't here, Lord, have a sovereign openness of communication. And Lord, an ears and heart to hear each other in truth and in honesty. Father, I bless each one here today in Jesus' name. And I'm going to ask you to do something. Husband and wives, I want you to join hands and I want you to look at one another and I want you to pray for one another. I want you to renew your commitment to one another and renew your commitment to the kingdom. Those of you that are standing there, find a friend and you just join hands just by twos and you just pray the blessing of the Lord and you just speak over one another's lives that you will fulfill the destiny of God in your lives. Oh, hallelujah. And then I'm gonna ask my husband just to blanket this whole place with a benediction. Oh. just minister over some of you. Thank you, Lord. Father, just bless your people in Jesus' name. Let your presence come down upon us. Break up the fallow ground within our heart and rain the rain of your presence upon us in Jesus' name. <laughs>